the average Jew believes that the Old Testament is a wonderful book of myths mm -hmm. and stories that have good meaning. Yeah. But you can understand the Old Testament only by studying the Talmud and the Kabbalah. The Jews stopped believing in the Torah starting in Genesis chapter 1. I believe creation was a design that's unending. Mm -hmm. uh, evolution is part of the process. And the beginning to me, you know, there are people who talk about the Big Bang Theory. Mm -hmm. I have no quarrel with them. So you don't take the beginning of Genesis with the Garden of Eden and the serpent, you don't take that literally then? No, I, I, to me, those are parables. So when you look at the key teachings of the books of Moses, Genesis through Deuteronomy, the Jews don't really believe any of these. Circumcision, I know, is a big part Ouch. of... <laughs> it's, it's a big part of, of Judaism, I, I think. Am I right? It is. If a, an adult comes to me for a conversion and is not circumcised, then it's a very simple matter. There's, you take the uh, pin and just prick the so that a drop of blood comes out, mm -hmm. and that's enough. That's so it's the, more symbolic. Right. Just to represent the willingness to be able to be part of that covenant. So they don't remove the full foreskin? No. Okay, they just do just a more of a symbolic? Exactly. Well, in the Torah, you know, Abraham was 99 when he was <laughs> circumcised, and his son Ishmael was 13, right? But nowadays, they don't. They don't. Now, we as New Testament Christians don't practice circumcision. But the Jews, remember, are saying that they still follow that old Mosaic law. So if they were actually following it, they would have to actually remove the foreskin and circumcise that adult convert. That's what the Torah teaches. I've heard it said so many times that, oh, the Jews, they just believe the Old Testament. They, they, they believe everything we do just without Jesus. And that is a lie. They don't believe God. They don't believe Jesus Christ. They don't believe the Old Testament. They don't believe the New Testament. They don't believe any of it. And how is it determined which is good and which is bad? And that's called civilization. People get together and determine you shouldn't steal. So civilization says that's bad. Okay, that's how you measure good. If you come from a society where stealing is good, that's how that civilization determines good from bad. If you don't steal, you're bad. If you do steal, you're part of us. Is there an absolute right and wrong where just stealing's always wrong because God said so? There's no absolute in my opinion. It says in John 5, 46 and 47, for if ye had believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? Jesus Christ is telling the Jews of his day that they did not believe Moses. Their whole claim was that they believe Moses and they don't believe him. But he explains here that if you don't believe in him, then you don't believe in Moses. We practice differently, we believe differently, and maybe our approach is different, but the destination is the same. We're trying to reach God. I mean, that's the whole objective. So you believe that all religions are going to the same destination, just taking different routes to get exactly, there. Exactly, and different ways to get there and different understandings of how they get there. But that doesn't make one better than the other. There is no one path to God. There is no one understanding of God. To understand God, we have to understand each other. We have to understand ourselves. There is no such thing as a salvation um, that transforms it. You do what is right and you save yourself at every moment. God is not in heaven. If when someone starts telling me that his soul is in heaven, what do they know about the soul, the spiritual souls of people in heaven? This is for children. You have to tell them this way. How come grandfather didn't come home today? Oh, he's in heaven. What about hell? Is, is hell something that, that is part of Judaism or no? It being like a place of fiery punishment, for example. I have been in hell. Mm. What we call hell is the Valley of Hinnom. Tophet also, right? There is a place right outside of Jerusalem that is called the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom. Mm -hmm. It was a place where pagans used to offer human sacrifices. And by extrapolation somehow, 
if they imagined that there was a place like that in the universe somewhere where wicked people would be going. So you, you don't believe that the Old Testament teaches any kind of a, a literal hell? No. Okay, all right. A lot of people will tell you the Bible says if you don't do something, you'll have a bad life or you'll go to the netherworld. Hell. Yeah, right, well, right. we don't subscribe to hell anyway, <laughs> but you know, that kind of, uh, my feeling is different if the Jews don't believe in the creation story of Genesis 1, they don't believe the story of Adam and Eve literally, they don't believe in Noah, they don't believe in the Tower of Babel, they scoff at these stories, they don't believe in circumcising adults, they don't believe in the animal sacrifice, what part of the Torah do they believe in? This is supposedly their most exalted book, yet when you look at all the particulars of what the Torah teaches, they don't believe any of it. Today you have a lot of evangelical Christians in America that are very pro-Israel. Very. Christians are just really zealous in their uh, support of, of Israel. Now, has it always been that way throughout history? Oh, Is that God, a newer no. phenomenon? Yeah. Um, no, it, it hasn't been that way through history. Traditionally, uh, Christianity was essentially anti-Semitic. The phenomenon of the Christian Zionists is relatively recent. They maintain that the Jews are God's chosen people and will always be God's chosen people. They use the term the apple of God's eye. And, and that's a more recent phenomenon? Yeah, I'd say a few hundred years, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. That does not go all the way back. Right. Replacement theology mm -hmm. has played a very important role in Christianity. But well, what is replacement theology? Replacement theology is the root and branch of Christian anti-Semitism. It's like a virus in the church basically is saying that the church now has superseded Israel and this theology that discards the place of the Jewish people and replaces it with the church, the new and true spiritual Israel, is very dangerous because I believe it's the primary root of anti-Semitism. Many theologians all through the centuries have preached replacement theology. Can you name some that, that have preached that? I have here everything about uh, John Chrysostom, and uh, the, 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 he is the chief anti-Semite of the church. The synagogue is worse than a whorehouse. It is the den of scoundrels and the repair of wild beasts. The temple of demons devoted to idolatrous cults the refuge of debauchees and the cavern of devils. It is a criminal assembly of Jews, a place of meeting for the assassins of Christ, a den of thieves, a dwelling of iniquity, the refuge of devils, a gulf and an abyss of perdition. I would say the same thing about their souls. They have demonized the Jews. This is still present in the mind of many. Throughout history, Christians have not looked at the Jews as God's chosen people. They looked at him as a people that rejected Christ and were therefore rejected by God. For example, the last book written by Martin Luther before he died was called The Jews and Their Lies. And in this book, he gives all kinds of scriptural arguments for why the Jews are not God's chosen people. And he also exposes a lot of the blasphemous teachings of the Talmud. His very last sermon, he preached about the Jews. And he said, the Jews hate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And through their perfidious behavior, and he says that they, they create all kinds of stratagems and ruses to deceive us. And he got so angry at them, he actually said, we should go and burn all the copies of their Talmud. But he was inf infuriated about the Talmud. Of course, today, the Jews consider him a great anti-Semite. St. Augustine was no better. He was also anti-Semitic? That's mm -hmm. right. Okay. He was very demeaning. All this mm. is pure hatred. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether you're listening to John Chrysostom, St. Augustine, Peter the Venerable, Martin Luther, John Calvin, you name the church father, you name the Protestant leader throughout history. They're all saying the same thing about the Jews, that they're the synagogue of Satan, that it's a false religion. 
This doctrine that the Jews are still God's chosen people is a new doctrine. You know, back before the late 1800s, everybody recognized what we're talking about now. Mm -hmm. But something began to change. First with Dr. Uh, you know, Cyrus Schofield. C.I. Schofield was a divorced man. He had trouble with alcohol. He was a lawyer turned preacher. He left his first wife, Leontine Sierre, in 1883. That's the year after he wrote his first book, Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. So in 1882, he writes his first book, Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. 1883, he leaves his first wife, marries another lady, and then becomes a pastor in Texas. Very famous, very popular. Schofield's dispensational premillennial Bible was edited with financial assistance from prominent businessmen, some of which had questionable religious ties. And he had Jewish retainers who made him a member of a club called the Lotus Club, mm -hmm. a, a sort of a secret society. And suddenly he had plenty of money. This corrupt lawyer who had abandoned his wife and was found guilty of numerous offenses as, as a corrupt attorney. But Schofield was given money and the Oxford group out of England published his Bible. Why would they take a crooked lawyer and make him the editor of a Bible? And then suddenly they had millions of dollars to promote it. With that amount of money, then the Bible took off. And it, it basically sealed the deal for the Jews. The Schofield Reference Bible is very pro-Israel, very Zionist. And this book, more than any other book, changed the thinking of an entire generation of young preacher boys. Another belief that Christians have today that is an incorrect belief that is not founded in scripture is the belief that we should bless Israel. You know, they, they go back to the, what they refer to as the Abrahamic covenant. They go back to Genesis chapter 12 and they say, oh, we got to bless Israel. If we want God's blessing, we have to bless them. Genesis 12 verses one through three is the key scripture where God calls and blesses Abraham. It reads, now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now, according to this scripture, God is making a covenant with Abraham, and he tells Abraham, I will bless thee. The word thee is singular. He's speaking to Abraham. Well, in Schofield's notes on Genesis 12, he applies this blessing unto the future nation of Israel. That is not what the scripture teaches. And many evangelical Christians today do not get their doctrine on Israel from anything that's written in the New Testament. They're getting it from the notes of the Schofield Reference Bible. When you're reading these promises made to Abraham in the Old Testament, you have to realize what the Bible teaches in Galatians 3.16, when it says, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Now, if we stop right there, you know, all the Christians of today or Zionists or whoever, they could say, see, it was to Abraham and his seed. But the verse goes on, it says, he saith not and to seeds, with an S at the end, making it plural. He says, he saith not and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. So according to the Bible, the promises made to Abraham were made unto Abraham and unto Christ. And the Bible says in verse 29, and if ye be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. According to the Bible, we as Christians, whether we be Jew or Gentile, are the heirs of the promises made to Abraham. Those today who are in the Middle East and the nation of Israel, they're not in Christ. 99% of them do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, they are not the seed of Abraham. Therefore, Genesis 12, one through three does not apply unto them. You know, people will say, well, we've got to support Israel if we want God's blessing on ourselves. If we want God's blessing on our church, if we want God's blessing on our nation, we must support a physical Israel. Well, if you just count back the last 66, 67 years of American history, do you find the blessing of God on our country? Did we have legalized abortion back in the 1940s? No, it's come since then. What was our debt? in the 1940s versus today. 
What were we like then compared to what we are now? You can't convince me that the blessings of God have fallen on this country because of a quote-unquote promise to support a physical group of people somehow correlates to blessings from God. 